All right, I'm getting the high sign. Good evening, everybody. Thank you. I am Sarah Rosen Wartell. I have the great honor and privilege of being the president of the Urban Institute and also of opening up tonight's uh, discussion. Um, I want to thank you all for joining us for what we expect to be a terrific conversation on household financial volatility, how pervasive it is, unfortunately too much, how people are coping, not always as well as we'd like, and how we collectively all can do better. Um, I want to welcome those of you who are online watching now or perhaps later. And I encourage everyone in the audience, here in the room and online, if you want to be involved in the dialogue as the conversation is going on, please share your thoughts or observations on social media using the hashtag Live at Urban, uh, which is also on the page here. And if you got your program when you came in, you will have noticed that the speaker's Twitter handles are on the program. So if you want to comment or uh, react to their uh, remarks, please make sure that you uh, credit them and help their, uh, their audiences grow. Um, and if you uh, are tuning in on the webcast and you want to submit questions, you can send your questions at any time during the conversation to events at urban.org. And um, then later in the conversation, we'll filter those up to the moderator. So more and more Americans are living with unpredictability and uncertainty about their household incomes, expenses, and even their employment. Um, uh, especially for those at the lower end of the income and wealth spectrum, this means that budgeting and savings are especially challenging. For those of us who are in Washington, understanding this situation is critical for policymaking. For too long, we have built policies on the assumption that people's incomes were stable and predictable. Everything from eligibility for various forms of public assistance to um, underwriting loans for public programs. And it turns out that many of those rules may actually be ineffective or even counterproductive in the reality we face where there's a great deal of income volatility. And please, folks, there are seats here in the front if you want to come on down. So tonight, we're going to try to increase public knowledge and understanding of this issue. And we're going to look at it both quantitatively and qualitatively. Our panel will discuss how families and communities cope and the public policies and financial service products and services that can make a difference in increasing household financial health and stability. We've done research here at the Urban Institute, including by one of our panelists, Carolyn Ratcliffe, that shows us that income volatility not only arms today's families, but also can have long-term effects on outcomes for their children and also uh, weaken the fabric of their communities and the cities, suburbs, towns, and rural areas that they live in. So today we're going to drill down to examine the financial health of residents in local communities and help talk about evidence-based solutions. We're joined today by Rachel Snyder, who is co-author of The Financial Diaries, How American Families Cope in a World of Uncertainty that is forthcoming very, very soon, I think. Uh, and also Lisa Servan, who authored out and available to you on Amazon, The Unbanking of America, How the New Middle Class Survives. We're also joined by Bruce Murphy from Key Corp, where he oversees community development lending with a focus on low to moderate income individuals. Each of these speakers is a pioneer in our understanding of this question of volatility and working hard at strategies for improving people's financial lives in the face of uncertainty and volatility. But they come from different disciplines, different perspectives, which I think should create a lively discussion with each other and with you. And more importantly, I think they will help us to realize that while we are absolutely are talking about policy, many of these questions are also questions of practice, the way that employers and financial institutions and others uh, relate to uh, individual families. We hope that these discussions will help bring research into practice and help all these sectors work together to enhance the financial lives of all Americans. Finally, I'd like to introduce tonight's moderator, Ellen Seidman. And this is um, special and personal for me. Um, I have been mentored by and made smarter by Ellen for more than 20 years. And the topics that we are talking about today are those closest to her heart and her passion. She has worked on them in the government service at the Office of Thrift Supervision, in the private sector at Shore Bank, where she helped also to found the Center for Financial Services Innovation. Here at Urban, she's helped to edit two important books in the field. 
what counts and what it's worth, what counts for harnessing data for America's communities, and what it's worth how we strengthen the financial future of families, communities, and the nation. She has been an important collaborator and colleague, not only to me, but I believe to each and every one of the panelists on today's discussion, and probably some others as well uh, in this room. <laughs> I've seen a lot of heads nodding. Uh, and finally, I, I, I uh, uh, failed to really introduce Carolyn Ratcliffe, senior fellow here at Urban Institute, who's done uh, great work in this area. So please join me in welcoming this terrific panel. Thanks for being here, everyone. Thank you, Sarah. That was really very sweet. Um, and thank you all for being here. Um, once again, for those of you on the webcast, uh, please submit questions that you'd like the panel to consider uh, to events at urban.org. And everybody should feel free to tweet using the hashtag um, live at urban. So much of the research about and policies involving families and their financial needs assume that income and expenses are stable, at least over the course of a year, if not longer. And this applies not only to eligibility for income support and benefit programs, but also to concepts such as how much income is, is needed to have a mortgage, or how do you think about the repayment of a small dollar credit loan. Since at least the early 2000s, researchers have begun to focus in on year-to-year -year volatility and on some of the risks that that presents, especially in the context of reduced government and employee sa employer safety nets. The discussion we're going to have tonight both builds on that work and takes it deeper and further. For as our speakers will discuss, not only are the incomes of many Americans, an increasing number of them, volatile year to year, they're also volatile month to month. Moreover, these households also face uncertainty and volatility and expenses, and the spikes and dips in expenses rarely line up with the spikes and dips in income. As Sarah said, our four panelists have been researching this problem and moreover doing something about it for many years. They're experts not only on the problems household, of household income and expense volatility pose for families and communities, but also how families are coping and what more can be done to improve both family and community financial health. We'll discuss some of the policy implications of our deeper understanding of household finances. So Sarah's already briefly introduced the panel. Let me just remind you, this is Rachel Schneider. She's a senior vice president at the Center for Financial Services Innovation, or CFSI, a nonprofit that's the country's leading authority on consumer financial health. And Rachel, together with Jonathan Mordock, is um, the author of the upcoming book, The Financial Diaries, on which much of her discussion tonight will be based. And I love that book, <laughs> so, as if you won't be able to figure that out. Um, Carolyn Radcliffe is the co-director of the Opportunity and Ownership Initiative here at the Urban Institute and a senior fellow here. For many years, she's been one of the country's foremost researchers on issues involving individual finances and how they affect both individuals and the communities in which they live. Lisa Servan is a professor of city and regional planning at the University of Pennsylvania. Lisa's written extensively, and I suspect some of you, particularly New Yorker fans, have read Lisa's work on her time being a check casher and working at a payday lender. And she's the author of a new book based in part on those experiences called The Unbanking of America, and there's a table back there. Finally, Bruce Murphy is Executive Vice President and Head of Corporate Responsibility at KeyBank. Bruce and Key are pioneers in understanding the needs, challenges, and opportunities for working constructively in a large financial institution with the families that the other three panelists will discuss. I have admired Bruce's work for many, many, many years and prayed that Key would get through the financial crisis independently, <laughs> and it has. So, yes. We have. Rachel will <laughs> lead us off, and then uh, we will uh, go till about 7 o'clock and then open up for Q&A. Rachel? All right, so thank you so much for having me. And I, um, I was one of the people nodding vociferously when Sarah said that many in this room have been mentored by Ellen. And I have to say that the work I'm going to talk about is much stronger because of Ellen's many difficult and important questions as she looked at many, many versions of the work. Um, and I also, I really want to acknowledge our supporters. So the Financial Diaries was supported by the City Foundation, the Ford Foundation, and the Omidyar Network. 
And just before we came in, um, Sarah was saying something about the need to keep doing long-term work as well as focus on the urgency of the present. And I really, I can't say strongly enough how this work could not have been done without philanthropic supporters who got that because we started it um, at least seven years ago. And you know they've been impatient, but they've stuck with us. And um, thank goodness because these issues of economic insecurity aren't going anywhere so far, and there's a long-term set of work for us all to do. Um, so, so I'll start by sharing a story. I think that's what people have been most interested in in the financial diaries, in a way. Um, because what we did is we had a chance to work really deeply with 235 families scattered across the US. And we tracked their financial lives over the course of a year. And we tried to gather information about every single dollar that came through the house. And I, we didn't capture 100% by any means, but we got pretty close. And because we were gathering the data by having field researchers sit with the families in person, we generated a lot of trust. And we got to hear a lot of the backstory and a lot of the why behind people's financial lives. So I'll talk a little bit about somebody we've called Elaine Sullivan. And none of the names are in the book or anywhere else are their real names. Um, but Elaine really encapsulates what has happened in our economy over the last few decades. Elaine, um, start for the last. For about 15 years, she was working uh, managing the kitchen at an elementary school. And it was a steady job, good benefits. She was part of union organizing there. And she thinks that that's why when they ultimately did a round of layoffs, she was on the list. Um, and she found herself unemployed for about a year and a half while she re, you know, looked for a new job. So she moved in with her mom. She's got three grown kids who are mostly on their own. So she's able to live rent free. And ultimately, she landed a job working at, in a fast food restaurant. And then you fast forward a year or two later, she's worked her way up to being manager of three restaurants. And she actually says she really, really likes her job. It's, a, it's like a fun job. She likes the people she works with. She feels like she's learning new skills. There's a lot about it that's enjoyable. Um, but the big difference between this job and her former job is that her income now fluctuates week to week. So over the course of the time that we got to know her, um, her lowest paycheck was $378, and her highest paycheck was 831. It's a huge gap. Right? So her average paycheck of $620, she experienced that most of the time, um, but um, enough of the time she was earning so much above or below her average that planning was really difficult. And she's one of the people who you would say, um, actually, her spikes and her dips and her spending and, and earnings actually were often quite aligned, because she didn't have the cushion to be able to let them not be aligned. Um, and um, she, she talked about how grateful she was that she had been promoted to manager, because that meant she was the person who worked the most hours every week and had the most control over how many hours she got. But it also meant that she was responsible for tracking the, a, a ratio of the number of hours being worked relative to the revenue, which she was able to look at you know, in real time constantly. And if that ratio got out of whack, she was going to hear about it pretty quickly. And so she you know, felt like it was her responsibility to be really fair about who she sent home first, because everybody wanted more hours. Um, and so what you see is this volatility in her life is really caused by a fundamental shift in the way work works. Not only that people are part-time, but that we talk about productivity gains, efficiency gains in our economy. Usually what that means is timing labor to demand. Right? What that means is that businesses are able to shift risk from the institution to an individual. And that is an uh, entirely new layer of um, risk that people now need to manage. Um, so she's managing this through debt, through credit, um, and has a growing credit card burden. Um, but what re really could push her over the edge is health care. So she you know, had some health care trouble over the course of the year, and she's insured. But she said it was hard to find a uh, provider who took her insurance. So she ended up with a pretty big copay. And she feels like maybe if she'd worked harder, she would have found somebody. But she just couldn't find somebody who she'd get 100% coverage with. So now she has this $8,000 um, bill that she's hoping she can establish a payment plan with the hospital about. And, and so like, I really think you have to think about, well, how, what, what does that payment plan look like, given the volatility of her income? 
Like a steady payment is not going to be very useful for her. And she might be able to pay that amount down over time, but only if she had a lot of flexibility about you, you know, grabbing the spikes when she needed them to pay it off. Um, and so we, we need to think a, a lot differently in, about financial obligations given that volatility. So I'll pause there. I could go on and on, but I know there's so much more here. I, I want to hear what my fellow panelists have to say. Caroline? All right. Um, okay, so I just want to say it's terrific to be part of this panel with this esteemed group. Um, I want to make three points um, and provide a little bit of data. Um, so the first point is that income volatility or these income shocks are felt by a large share of families, that these income disruptions trigger hardship for families, and also start a little bit of the conversation about coping mechanisms. So first, income volatility happens often. Roughly 25% of families experience an income shock within a year, so we're looking month to month. Um, and here we define income shock uh, as an involuntary job loss, the onset of a health-related work limitation, or otherwise a large 50% change in uh, income from month to month. But beyond these income disruptions, there are these expense disruptions that uh, Rachel just mentioned. So it can be a large health bill, fixing a car, and the data suggests that when you put this income and expense disruptions together, about 60% of families experience one of these shocks during the year. Um, so we're talking about an issue that affects a large share of families. And this is not just an issue for low-income families, that this goes up the income uh, rungs and affects larger uh, families with larger uh, income. Um, second, volatility is linked to greater economic hardship. So families who experience this volatility are significantly more likely to experience hardship than families that don't. And again, we see these shocks happen up the income scale. There we go. Um, so in this slide, we're looking at evictions, missed rent or mortgage payments, or missed utility bills. And what you're seeing is that these light blue lines are longer than the dark blue lines, and that means more hardship for families who experience these events. And we also see the same pattern. We're looking for each bar. We're looking at low, middle, and higher income families. Um, and that we're seeing that even these high income families, while their uh, hardship is lower, these shocks affect them. Um, it's not shown on this graph, but income volatility also affects food insecurity. And there's also research that finds that this volatility in families affects child health outcomes. Uh, and also their educational achievements, so that this volatility can have long-term impacts for families. And then to make a point about what uh, Sarah mentioned, is that family insecurity isn't just an issue for the family, that it's an issue for the wider community that they live in. That if we think about uh, financially stable adults, they're more likely to, or more able to contribute to the local economy through sales tax, paying property taxes. And here we look at rent and mortgage, but if you're, more, if, you're paying, if you're able to pay your rent, then your landlord's more able to pay their property taxes, and property tax base is very important for local communities. Utility bills for city-owned utilities, if people aren't paying those bills, that's a direct impact on city budgets. Um, so when we think about volatility, it's not just the person, but also the community. Um, so just moving on and just talking briefly um, oh, about, um, about coping, um, I'll just say a few things. Um, but when we look at families who experience income shocks, one of the strategies that they turn to is the social safety net. And we see significant increases in public benefit receipt among, uh, for people after these shocks. And again, this isn't just a low income issue. We see this for middle and higher income families. Um, and in addition to the social safety net, people turn to private safety net. And one of those is savings. So savings is an important cushion for families. In our research, we were surprised to find that having as little as 250 to $750 in savings, that those families with that amount of savings were less likely to experience hardship than families with no savings. And of course, 
higher levels of savings is better, but having some savings, that small cushion, helps families. Um, and so just, you may be thinking, well, the poor can't save or the poor shouldn't save. We know from research that the poor can save. And we have some new findings that um, are pretty exciting in terms of how savings really helps families. Um, so we recently released first year findings from a randomized evaluation of a savings program that encourages low income families to save. Um, I'm not gonna talk about the details of that program, but uh, it was an individual development account. People can ask questions. But we're looking at a very low income population. Half the people uh, in our sample had less than $15,000 in household income. And what we find at the end of the first year, the program increased median savings by $650, so that's an additional $55 per month that they were saving, which is a 300% increase over uh, the control group. Um, but one of our key questions is, was, are they better off? So they're saving this money, but could hardship increase because they're not taking care of other needs? Oops. Um, and what we find is that their material hardship didn't just remained flat, but it actually fell, that they, they had a one-third reduction in the number of hardships that they experienced. And we looked into the mechanisms, and it looks like it's a benefit receipt, that people in the program with the services, that they were maintaining their benefit receipt, um, where the people that weren't in the program, their benefit receipt fell. So again, what we see is that the social safety net is stepping in uh, to help families. Um, so just to sum up that these income disruptions happen to large share families, uh, that they experience uh, more hardship and there are long-term implications for children and that uh, there's uh, saving strategies, uh, both the social safety net and private safety net. Thanks, Caroline. So Lisa's gonna talk, Lisa and Bruce are gonna talk a little bit more about how the financial services sector does and doesn't <laughs> respond effectively. Go ahead. Right, thank you. Well, first, thank you, Ellen and Rolf Pendall in the audience who helped put this all together. Rolf and I went to graduate school together. And I also want to acknowledge Andrea Marpiero Colomina, who's in the back. Her talents are being currently way underutilized by selling books. She's one of my <laughs> research assistants and, and has done incredible work um, doing a lot of the field work and working right alongside me and lots of terrific research. So, um, so as Ellen mentioned, I um, the question that began my research was trying to understand if alternative financial services were so bad for people, check cashers, payday lenders, pawn shops, et cetera, why were so many people using them and not using banks? And so I think the, the kind of the intersection here is that a lot of people who do experience income volatility end up either um, leaving their banks or um, perhaps never being banked and you, turning to um, what are thought of as to be incredibly expensive alternative financial services um, in the meantime, I, uh, I started working as a teller in, this, in the South Bronx at a check casher for four months. I learned a lot about how people manage their money um, by working at the counter. And I also found that um, both working there and working at a, a payday lender in Oakland, California, making loans and then collect, doing loan collection, that um, the population, I think this is one of the big findings, the population that's using these services is not who I thought it would be. Um, and it kind of goes to a couple of little points that were on your graphs, Caroline, and actually this person even who you talked about who is using, uh, who, who had a steady job, right? Many, many of the people own their homes. They have college educations. They make fifty or $75,000 a year, many, much more than the people that in your savings demonstration. So the issue is why is that, right? Um, there are three trends, I think, that really contribute to that. One is the one that Rachel mentioned, which is the retraction of the public and private <coughs> safety net, um, shifting risk onto individuals, where they used to be covered, have better medical benefits, um, better uh, retirement benefits, et cetera, that they would get through their workplace. And if, the work, if work didn't work, they'd get it from the public sector. So um, in addition to working at these places, I also interviewed hundreds of people around the country um, not all of them, Andrea did a bunch of them too. But um, for example, one of the people I spoke with in California um, was a woman who had a public sector job. She, um, her, she, she, when she had her first child, she paid a $30 copay in order to have that child in the hospital and take care of all the medical expenses. 
Her next child, um, she was working at the same job, and nothing about her changed or her decision making, but the insurance plan changed, and she had a $3,500 deductible. Boom, payday loans, and in, in, in she gets into debt that she cannot get out of. Um, sometimes the income volatility is not, uh, so that's, that's one piece. Um, the other two things are declining wages since the 1970s, um, and this doubling of income volatility, which is the topic of today's focus. So those three things put together have really changed the conditions in which the American worker works for the worst, um, shifting many people's financial behavior out of necessity to not just using um, mainstream financial services, but also using alternative financial services. I also found that um, sometimes the shock that hits the system can just be a one-time event, and that can, the after effects of that can last for years. Um, I was in San Francisco last week re-interviewing a group of people who had taken out payday loans, and one of the women I spoke with uh, worked as a paralegal for the court system in San Francisco. She'd been at her job for 36 years. Um, during the recession, she was put on furlough along with many of her fellow paralegals. Um, needed to take out payday loans because there was no other nowhere she could turn, and um, she is still paying back those loans. So last year when we spoke with her, she had more of them out, but she still has three, um, and there's no no wiggle room, no place for her to get that money to pay back those loans. And so even though she's had this steady job, and you would not imagine that she's a person who's turning to an alternative financial services, um, that's what's happening. Um, the other piece, and I think Bruce will talk probably more about this too. The other piece of the equation is that uh, policy and bank practices have changed a great deal since, say, the 60s and 70s, right, and before that. So um, on the policy side, we faced an era of great deregulation starting in the 80s, um, which enabled banks to not just um, focus on consumers, but also to engage in both commercial and investment activities, to merge, to grow, to um, to work in all kinds of other products that took them farther away from the consumer. They also shifted their way, the ways in which they made money. So when I was a kid going to the bank, you know, I don't think my parents had overdraft protection because there wasn't such a thing really. Now banks are making $33 billion a year on overdraft fees um, from consumers. So, um, so when I talked to the people that I worked with, the customers at the check casher and the payday lender, they often told me that they had switched away from using banks because banks were too expensive, which goes completely against the conventional wisdom, right? Um, in fact, the one of the first times I told this story at the, on the CFSI stage, I was sitting next to Bruce and I'd never met him. And Bruce is so kind, at the end he said, you know, you should really come to Cleveland and see what <laughs> KeyBank is doing. Um, and I found that all banks are not created equal. KeyBank is doing amazingly well in terms of thinking about what those uh, consumers who may not be uh, the people who are making a lot of money for the banks need and doing that. Um, and so maybe I'll stop there, turn it over to Bruce, and i um, really grateful to be part of this discussion. Thank you. Um, you know, it's um, a privilege to be on the stage with uh, three people now. Uh, Ellen, who lassoed me into being <laughs> part of CFSI at the very beginning, yeah. watching Rachel build financial diaries, and as Lisa just described, um, our relationship began on a stage just like this, talking about this very important issue. So at our company, I will tell you um, our purpose is to help c consumers and communities thrive. Now, lots of times you, you will hear a, a catchphrase that people will use and to describe what it is they're trying to do. But I will tell you that there is a commitment at our company that is pro proven by our actions. And, I, and it's, been a, it's been a journey over 10 years. And so uh, I want to briefly take you through um, um, kind of how we ended up where we are and then to talk about the platform that is a result of this work that we started uh, over 10 years ago. But there were some operating principles that I want to focus on. First, you know, oftentimes banks focus on the Community Reinvestment Act as it relates to the consumers that we're talking about today. And they are focused on at least trying to get a satisfactory. 
I will tell you we have had eight consecutive outstandings and more importantly for us it is not the aspiration it's the deal so what does that really mean it is about commitment it's not about compliance if I'm just going to talk about compliance I'm going to do what minimally I have to do to stay out of jail and if the most it, it, but the most important thing is I'm only going to be making decisions that I can minimize my risk and minimize the amount of capital that I'm going to deck against this population. Because ultimately, you know, it is about how do I maximize the use of capital? That's the conversation you hear about in banks all the time. Maximize the return on the capital that you're investing. Capital is ultimately precious. And so what's different about that for us? What's different about that for us is that we understand balancing mission and margin provides for us three things. It provides us with the opportunity to make a difference in communities in a sustainable way. Secondly, it provides our employees who care about these communities that they live in an opportunity to see our presence. And thirdly, it does in fact create return. Does it create the same return that I have some whiz-bang financial uh, product that I, I have out there? The answer is no. But is it profitable? And the answer is yes. And so you have to have patient capital. You have to think about this over a longer period of time. And ultimately, you can't think about this work driven by product. You have to think about it in the context of relationship. And so the way we've built what I'm going to share with you in a second, which is a platform. Um, we started with understanding what the opportunity was, and this is where CFSI, as a partner, helped us really understand that uh, we started a, a check cashing business. Um, a check cashing business, we did some of the first research with the Ford Foundation and CFSI, that helped us understand that the person cashing checks is less about liquidation of the instrument, it's more about how they do their banking. And so we became very um, informed about how they are making personal choices. Oftentimes we make the mistake of suggesting that the, that, that the people in this space don't know how to manage money. I would suggest to you that they know how to manage money better than most of us. Because at the end of the day, because the, they always have more month than they have money and they're trying to figure out how to get to the end. And so they will do whatever they need to do in order to, to survive. And so we gained a great deal of insight. Um, myth busting. When you talk about, again, as I said, capital, best use of capital, we had to sh help the company understand that a check cashing client is more profitable than someone with a $50,000 CD. Now that is counterintuitive, but when you started to help them understand that it's, a, it's about volume, you have a smaller margin, but it's about volume and a relationship that lasts over a longer period of time. You now start to begin to understand that you can now have profitability. We also had the privilege of doing some testing and learning. We had, so we went out and we tried things. Based upon the research, we tried things. What were some of the things we tried? We understood if I now have a check cashing client coming in twice a month, what else are they really trying to do? What other things are they doing with that cash? And what other products now start to become more relevant to them that now they have an opportunity to um, bank with us in a broader way? And so we did some work around broadening the, 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 the product set as a result of having this insight. We ultimately got to a place that the underbanked and the underserved became a client segment. Just like mass market, the emerging affluent, the affluent, what does that mean? We had, we had resources decked against that segment to understand how it, how it um, in fact operates, how it wants to uh, engage um, uh, in the economy, what choices do they make. And so just like any other segment, uh, you did segment research. 
and begin to build a, a plan around how do I now respond. And then getting senior leadership engagement. You know, what that really means is that Richard Hartnick, um, many of you remember Richard, um, we first engaged with Richard when he was at Union Bank, and he really started the first check cashing business. When we visited with him, the thing he said to me, which was compelling, he said, the problem is not going to be at the top of the house, nor is it going to be in the, on, the, on, the, on the ground with people dealing with this every day. It's going to be in the big middle, because they're trying to figure out how to keep you from harming the company. <laughs> and at the end of the day, you have to figure out how to deal with that big middle. And so we spent time helping the big middle understand that there was value because senior management decided that this was an important segment to invest in. And so we did work with ensuring that through the system, the people began to value what we, uh, what we were supporting. So what we have, and I'm not going to take you through uh, all of this, but ultimately what we have is a platform dedicated against this segment. And since I can't see that, <laughs> I'm, of that I'm of that age. So we have a set of deposit products, um, hassle-free. Hassle-free is a product that was built on the bones of a product that we built for the underbanked and the underserved called um, 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 <laughs> See, it's so long ago you forgot. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a product built specifically for that segment. That product today is a mass market product that serves the underbanked and is under, uh, underserved, but it is the product that has driven more clients into the company in the last 10 years. It was again built on the bones, on a product that fundamentally operated for the underbanked. It is now a product that frankly has driven more client acquisition. And why is that? It gives clients choice and control. And that's what clients want. The, the ability to choose the kind of product that best fits them and gives them the control to make choice. And so uh, essentially what that product is, is it's a, it's a checklist checking account. You can't overdraw. You can, play, you can pay, um, 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 you can use the, the um, mobile banking system to pay your bills. Um, it gives you lots of features, except that it doesn't have checks. What is the one thing that causes you to overdraw your account. It's thinking that you've got money because I have checks. And I literally had a client that says, I have to have money because I still have checks left. Which is a whole different question about education. But the point is, it's a great product, but it was a product that was built originally for the underbanked and the underserved. We've got saving solutions. We've got cash solutions. We started this whole business on, on, um, on check cashing, as I mentioned earlier. We've got credit solutions. We have a, uh, a small dollar um, um, credit product. We were confronted with the reality of offering a payday loan. We decided that it wasn't good for clients. It would have been good for key, but it wasn't good for clients, and we opted not to offer a check cashing or a, a, um, um, a payday lending product. We have a product that is $250 to $5,000. Uh, and it is really a great product for, for those who need to fill that gap. We have a product called Loan Assist, which is a second chance product. It allows me to rebuild my credit. Um, we've got um, um, other coaching solutions. And I will tell you one of the major pieces, and I'm going to wrap up here quickly here in a second, but we have, a, we have a product that focuses on education and financial wellness. So if you, if you think about the, the progression of financial education, financial education started with just being a survey course, teaching people about you know, their debt, you know, uh, you know, what is a credit score, those kinds of issues. 
Then it moved to financial capability. So what do I do with that information? Now, what really is happening, and the research will su suggest to you, that people not only need to understand, but they need to have people who can coach them to be able to track and understand over a period of time with information what their choices are. And so we have teamed with uh, Hello Wallet, uh, Matt Fellows, who many of you uh, would know, who, who started that organization, and we offer to every client for free the ability to receive an online um, um, update on where they are with, from, with, from the perspective of financial health. We give them a financial health score, which is not a credit score, a financial health score. And they then have the ability to go into the branch and sit down with someone in the branch to talk about options to improve their, um, their financial health score. And so that's a different approach to financial education. Not that financial education um, isn't relevant, because it is. But you, you know, the next generation is really about how do I get to financial health. Um, so let me just wrap up quickly. Um, we have also, as a, ref as a reflection of our commitment, you know, we, we just acquired First Niagara Bank uh, in upstate New York. We have built a direct community engagement strategy, meaning we're continuing the process of getting community insight. How can we matter in your community? So each of our markets have a community engagement strategy that focuses on how we can be relevant. Um, insight driven. We're now working on additional products in that platform. And what we're doing is that we're going and socializing those products. In fact, we're, again, with CFSI, who's helping us build a product that we're going to be looking to launch. Again, client insight. And then it's about measuring and reporting our progress, being very transparent about what we're doing and what we're not doing. So it is a process. It's a journey. It started 10 years ago. And we feel very good that we are in a place that can serve clients, not perfectly. We're not you know, a perfect institution, but I feel uh, that we have a platform that um, our competitors do not have. Uh, and it's because of how we begin to think about this market space. We are committed uh, clearly to serving the markets, market space in a responsible fashion. Thank you, Bruce. Um, one of the things that uh, is very that people are talking about a lot now is income inequality and mobility. And um, Rachel, you have you spend a fair amount of time um, in the book that I have read that you all will get to read, um, talking about this question of how inc how um, financial instability intersects with mobility, and um, and also some of the findings that Pew. Um, had about whether people want stability or mobility, which seems like a horrible choice to have to make. So can we uh, talk a little bit about that? And, and let's bring in the policy conversation. After all, we are in Washington. So how does this all um, uh, relate to issues like um, income uh, asset limits, um, benefits uh, eligibility, the minimum wage, the income-based kinds of policy issues. And I'd, everybody jump in, please. So that, that was a, a doozy of a question. So um, there's You've a lot there. Yeah, so I'll start. And I'm sure everyone will have more to say. I mean, um, so Pew started asking this question in their research. I think, I think it was Diana Elliott's responsibility, who's now at Diana Urban, here? who's here. Um, so I hope I don't mangle it, because she's right there. <laughs> uh, but she asked this smart question about whether people would prefer to climb up the income ladder or have stability. So, um, and found that people um, say they'd prefer stability. So we asked that question also in the diaries. And certainly lower income people in our sample were more likely to say they wanted to move up the income ladder. Um, and it's a complicated question, because presumably if you moved up the income ladder, you'd have more stability. So, you know, it's, I think it's, it's in some ways a false choice, as you're pointing out, but it, is, it tells us something about how we're thinking about um, economic issues in our country that we would even ask the question. And um, 
what, uh, what we found with Thyre's families, which it's hard to say we found in a statistically representative way, you know, it's more our impressions from talking with lots of people about their lives, is that um, it's very hard for people to envision mobility while they are unstable and that there's constantly a trade-off. So there's one woman we wrote about in the book who we called Sarah Johnson, who very consciously is choosing mobility as a path to stability. But in the meantime, her life is a complete mess, right? So she's going to college while working full-time and raising children and getting increasingly in debt and making jokes that she'll be paying her student loans for the rest of her life because she's going to graduate from college at age 40. Um, but it's a, it's a pretty intentional strategy by her that you know, eventually she'll be able to earn more and then eventually be, she'll be um, stable. But she's declared bankruptcy twice along that path. So it's a really hard way to do it. Um, whereas I think, um, you know, if Elaine, um, the person I spoke about earlier, I think isn't even in that mind frame. It's purely about what does she need now in her financial life. And, and so in the book we talk about it, this distinction between people thinking about now versus later versus this third time zone of soon. And often in our policy debates, we are worried about how to get people to plan for later and not spend now, right? With, so, with billions of dollars of tax subsidies to get people to save for retirement, buy homes, right? These big long-term objectives. But we really have very little that's designed for how people can deal with the needs of the next three to 12 to 36 months. And that's where people are struggling. And my, my perception is that um, it, people, that soon area, that like what am I going to do soon, is much more salient. It's much more near term. It's much, it's much more um, viscerally painful for people. And so we would talk to people about their retirement savings, and they'd say, yeah, I, I don't have enough. You know? uh, more than one person would say, well, I'm doing my $25 a month, but I know it's not going to get me anywhere. But it didn't have the same emotional like, weight as... Um, I had to fix my car or I couldn't get to work, right? And, and so I think, um, I think that's what's driving a lot of this question, this tension about uh, this reason why people are saying, yes, I want security more than moving up the income ladder. Um, I also have to say one last thing before closing out and uh, turning it over to other people. I think that the dynamics of this lack of feeling of secure in the present and the near term and the lack of connection people have to institutions um, are very much related. And they are related to the anger that we see in the current populist movements. Um, because people don't feel supported or connected to the institutions of their community, whether that's their employer or their bank or their you know, hospital. Right? The hospital that pushes you into bankruptcy is not a source of loyalty for you. Uh, so, it's, um, and I think that diminishes the layer of trust overall in our society. And it, it's, a, it's a much more global issue than just the economic security. It, it is a, it's very much integrated with the fabric of our society, the, the connectiveness that we feel with each other. So Lisa and Bruce, I'd, I'd really be interested in both of you uh, jumping in here because I know that this whole community connectivity thing is a, part, is a very important part of what you're thinking. So, so the place I would go is that over 50% of consumers have no confidence, no confidence that they can manage their financial future. Right. No confidence at all. And so 70% want help to be able to do something about their financial future. What that says to me is that there really is an opportunity to, to serve a need that's clear and obvious. And what is that need? It's about helping people make better financial choices. Now, part of the problem they have is that they don't have the capital to do a lot about their financial choices. Um, and so there's a, there, there's, there's a different uh, issue that you also have to address. But starting at the starting point that really says, let me help you at least understand, it's almost like, so, so, so financial health, it's almost like when you're going and getting your physical with the doctor. The doctor then tells you, here are the things that you can do better to improve your, your, your physical health. It's the same thing with financial health. Get to the place that can at least give you a direction around how you might be able to um, 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 address the concerns that you might have. 
So Lisa, uh, you talked a little bit, uh, Caroline talked a little bit about um, community and I know that this is something that, that you're really interested in too and some of the negative impacts of how people use their community to cope as well as the positive ones. Right. Um, yeah, I mean, I was going to say two things about that question. One is that uh, one of the things that surprised me the most, and I wasn't really expecting this when I went to work at both of these places, um, and I actually opened my book with a story about going to the bank with my dad when I was a kid in the 60s and 70s, and how that was kind of a community space, and there were tellers that were from the same town that my dad grew up in and everyone knew each other and I got the green pass book and all that and you know it kind of felt like this rite of passage to get a bank account and start saving um, and I didn't really think much about how that's changed because I frankly like doing my paying my bills you know late at night in my pajamas and that kind of works but um, when I started working at the check cashier I realized that it was a lot like the bank I went to when I was a kid partly because people come in all the time. That's how check cashers and payday lenders make their money, is by having a lot of transactions. Um, but it also was, so when I, but when I talked to people about why they were choosing to manage their money there, um, it was a big, service was a big part of the, the reason. Um, the three reasons were cost. They felt like it was less expensive than their banks, and I could talk more about any of these reasons later. Transparency, they felt like it was the, the costs and the services that were available were a lot more clear. And the third was um, service, that they felt like they got much more service. And certainly there was still that face-to-face -face relationship there. Um, I also did a lot of work looking at informal financial mechanisms, particularly in the South Bronx neighborhood where I worked, um, and saw a lot of people who were participating in these rotating savings and credit associations. Like, does anyone not know what these are? I can explain them. Yeah. OK, so I'll do it really fast. Um, these are small informal groups of people who, who have kind of a single person who acts as a banker. Everybody in that group, let's say there's 10 people, um, contributes the same amount of money once a week. Let's say it's $100. And every week, a different person in the group gets the payout. So in week one, um, Bruce gets $1,000. It's kind of like a short-term loan. If I get it in week 10, then it's forced savings. Um, and so this is totally informal. Um, what I found that was super interesting that people were that people were using mainstream financial institutions to enable their participation in the informal circles. They would direct deposit their deposits, their their contributions sometimes into the bank account of the woman who ran the circle. Fascinating. Um, the other thing I was going to say just quickly that this reminds me of this instability stability versus mobility piece is uh, millennials, which um, was a group that. Uh, with Andrea's encouragement, we went deep into to try to understand, uh, because millennials were not, did not have that experience that I did going to a bank, and I think what's um, really critical right now is the fact that this person you're talking about, Rachel, who is, you know, getting into debt and going bankrupt, she's banking on this, um, this ladder, right, that if I do this, then that will happen. Um, we don't even know if she's right or not. And so that's the key thing that's changed, is even if you say, I want stability or I want mobility, there is no formula anymore. There was a formula for probably most of us who are sitting up here on stage, but there isn't anymore. And so, you know, some of the millennials told us really um, heartbreaking stories about saying, like, I, I have this debt, I've done everything right, you know, what, what it would have been right for you 20 years ago. Um, but I'm in a situation now where I have to think about, do I want to own a house or have a child? Do I want to save reti for retirement or, um, or do I want to do a job that I really love? Um, these were not trade-offs that my parents made or that, that I made. Um, and so that kind of, even knowing what to do it to get stable, being clear on your goals is not enough to be able to get there. So before... Um, I'm going to save the bigger policy issues for the questions, and I'm going to actually prime you to ask some of them. But I want to go a little bit to geography for just a minute, um, because we've heard a lot of talk um, coming off the, of the election about rural and small town America. And um, Rachel, I want to ask you about the, the, the diaries work. And um, Caroline, can you put up your slide mm -hmm. with the circles? Yeah, okay, so you can't see those all that well. But the diaries work was done in New York, um, in, in the corner of um, Ohio and Kentucky, in Mississippi, and then in San Jose. And so maybe I should just, should I just explain yes, this go graph? Ahead. Okay, so 
what this is, it's, uh, we're looking at, this is mapping by county. This is the share of people with a credit bureau file who we define as having healthy credit, which means they have at least one trade that hasn't been delinquent in the last year. So you have a credit card or an auto loan that's not been uh, delinquent in the last year, and you don't have any other delinquent debt in the last couple of years, last two years. So you can see when you look at this, this graph, so dark colors are worse, light colors are better. But this is the share in the counties, and you can see that the highest the lightest color is in the 70 to 80 percent range, meaning that 20 to 30 percent of people in those best counties uh, don't have healthy credit, and those dark uh, blue are areas that uh, between 11 and 40 percent um, have healthy credit, so more than 60 percent uh, don't have healthy credit. So, Rachel, two of your yeah. circles are in the dark blue and two of them are in the lighter blue and the lighter blue ones to, are urban and the darker blue ones are less urban. What did you find? So I'm, I'm particularly grateful always to be able to present this research with people who have done nationally representative um, work, right? This, so the diaries, even though we were in all of these areas, we don't have a statistically representative number in any of them or even overall. Um, so take what I say with that fairly large grain of salt. I mean, I would say what we saw was actually that the dynamics are pretty similar in different parts of the country, and that um, people are struggling with economics, issues of economic stability in urban areas and rural areas. Um, there's obviously, you know, I, I suspect that what you see here in these charts where, you know, um, California, the place where we were in California looks better than the place where we were in Mississippi is more about the diversity of those communities, right? So we were in San Jose, which is near a lot of wealth, um, and in counties that have people with more stable financial lives. But nonetheless, the people we were working with were still unstable. And so it manifests in different ways. The New York families spent inordinate percentages of their income on rent, and the rural families spent similarly large percentages of income on transportation. Um, and it plays out in really important ways in their lives in terms of the, like the nuts and bolts of how economic insecurity feels. Like living in a really crowded place, right, with three families crammed into one apartment feels bad in one way. But needing to drive an hour to get to a doctor and rely on a cousin to take you there because you can't afford gas money feels equally bad, but in a different category, right? So, so look, I, I, to me, feel like we're... We're in a danger of overblowing the, the distinctions of geography because economic insecurity is actually a, quite a universal issue. And it's important that we, we think about it in a targeted, universal way, right? You might need slightly different interventions in New York than in a rural place. Um, but the pain people are feeling is quite similar. Can I just yeah, add here that we are uh, using these data to start to look at urban yeah. and rural areas? And you do see lots of similarity across the areas in terms of healthy credit, um, subprime scores. Uh, the levels of debt are lower in rural areas with one exception, and that's auto loan, so the transportation that you just brought up. So it really yeah, fits nicely with what you're finding. Lisa or Bruce? Yeah, I was going to say from, from a bank's perspective, as we think about opportunity, we look at the Rust Belt. You know, there, there are three dynamics that are consistent. Affordable housing, affordable housing, and affordable housing. <laughs> right. At the end of the day, affordable housing is a, is a um, in, in my view, um, it's alarming that people do not have safe and affordable places to live. And that's in the Rust Belt. That's in the Talk Rust about Belt. about New York and San Francisco. When yeah. I, when I, when I, when, when you talk about affordable housing in Seattle, when the average cost of, how, uh, of a home is over $300,000, or nearly f over $400,000, affordable is a whole, different, it's a whole different dynamic. If you're in Alaska, um, it's a different dynamic. And so, you know, what we are doing, clearly, is that we're, you know, you, you heard me talk about these community engagement strategies. We're trying to understand the dynamics in each of those markets and then, then deciding how we are going to address those issues. Affordable housing, our, our community development lending and investment uh, business is exploding. 
because there is opportunity and we, you know, frankly, we don't have the capacity to, uh, to address all those individual needs. I think also there's, um, you know, we need to look at the policy environments too. This is something that we're going to drill down a little bit more on, but um, uh, one of the things I've been working on lately is uh, starting with a very big data set from a subprime credit bureau and then doing an analysis of that data, a survey of the people in that data set, and then individual interviews. And um, Andrea and I went to Dallas, Fort Worth, and um, the Bay Area last year. We we're just starting to re-interview these people. And one of the things that we found was we heard a lot more, these were all payday borrowers, we heard a lot more about medical debt in Texas than we did in California, right? So, um, so thinking about where the Affordable Care Act has landed differently, um, mm -hmm. these things make a big difference. The cost of housing, we heard a lot more in the Bay Area about people supporting adult children. This is a huge thing that's happening right now, whether they're moving back in with their parents or whether they live outside the house but the parents are still supporting them. And there's you know, all kinds of emotional stuff about shame and embarrassment and I as the parent should be able to provide, but meanwhile they're taking out payday loans in order to do it. Um, and so some of those, both the policy and the things like housing, um, the cost differences make a huge difference. Go ahead, John. I was just going to, because medical debt has come up a number of times, um, Urban just released some uh, maps yesterday mm -hmm. that shows how medical debt has fallen since 2012 and some other research that shows that uh, health insurance, uh, higher health insurance is associated with lower debt and collections. And our health policy group um, has some forthcoming work looking at this same issue that the ACA, that it's not necessarily just medical, that the, the, the health insurance isn't necessarily just associated with medical debt, but it's associated with better uh, well-being more broadly. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to turn to questions now, and those of you who would like to ask about consumer protection and the CFPB, <laughs> uh, about jobs, about policies involving job stability, or about, if you really want to get geeky, the OCC's proposed uh, fintech charter, um, you're welcome to ask about those, but you're welcome to ask about anything else, too. So maybe we'll start with the, yes, in the back. Um, hi there. I had a question about some of the products that KeyBank offers to customers, and um, I don't know very much about your business beyond um, kind of what you just explained, but I'd be curious to know um, what sort of barriers you see to adoption of these products among the communities in which you're active, uh, and how they sort of view you as a bank that might be trying to do better by them, but within the context of like financial services more broadly. So Bruce, you can also answer the question of why aren't more banks following you? <laughs> um, I may not speak for my compatriots, but I'll attempt to, to give a perspective. But to your question, um, the products that we built, when we did the acquisition, we had community conversations. And what we found is that there was still a lot of people who, who knew nothing about these products. And what was happening is that um, we really had not activated a engagement strategy at a level that helped people really understand the products. Because every time we talk about it in a place like Buffalo, they're running out of these meetings and saying, I got to go get this product. Well, again, that was a, 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 um, a limitation on our part. We did not think about how do we get these products to those consumers who best um, uh, would be able to use them. And so that's something that we've ultimately uh, addressed. Um, when we start to talk about um, uh, the adoption, the way that you get adoption is engagement. And, and, and how do you get engagement? You get the individuals that people trust to endorse these products and teach about the product and that's where you get adoption. Uh, and so, um, you know, advertising in the local neighborhood newspaper doesn't work. You know, a learning uh, from us. Um, ultimately, it's, it's better in the church basement when the person is able to talk to you about what, what the product really does. That's where adoption begins to occur. So I would remind people um, who are on the webcast to send your questions in to events at urban.org, and I will get the person over there, but let me, um, I have one from the web first. 
Um, and uh, I'm not sure who wants, who can take this, but um, it, it's the question about the role that income volatility plays in anxiety and depression, and whether savings interventions can improve mental health. Anyone? I mean, I can certainly say from my interviews that this is something that people talk a lot about. If you Google the term money shame, you will come up with millions of results. There are people who are also trying to make money off of other people's money shame. But um, it's something that we don't really talk about publicly, I think, um, in, you know, kind of in polite company. And um, many, many people, you know, I worried about going into communities and interviewing people because I thought, wow, this is a super sensitive topic. Are people going to open up to me? But the fact that they didn't know me um, in some ways gave permission. A lot of people told me stories about their debt or their um, behaviors or things that they were embarrassed about from their past that they had not told their partners, you know, that they hadn't told anybody else. And so um, I think there's an enormous amount of anxiety that people are um, facing. I, I interviewed a man last week who um, is, is turning 75, um, is a CFO at a public utility company in California, makes about $10,000 a month, um, has two um, adult children that he is almost, and six grandchildren that he's supporting almost completely on his own, has a bunch of payday loans and loans from friends and family, and he, he's an eczema sufferer, you know, and said that he is, the last year has been unbearable for him, and it's, he really links it to the stress. And, I, you know, it's a representative story. So I think that's the, the weight of this kind of, kind of financial anxiety is incredible. And the other thing about it is, that even like that woman who I described before whose copay had gone way up, um, even though she didn't do anything wrong, or the woman who was put on furlough, people feel like somehow it's their fault. We have a narrative in our country that says you should be able to do this. You know, you should, it's, it's your fault somehow if you haven't figured it out and if you aren't able, able to pull yourself up by your bootstraps. And so that's why there's a lot of silence and that people don't feel comfortable um, saying that they're having an issue. Can I just Everyone's add, um, and the work that's really that's looking at children, that the mechanism that this is moving through, it's not just that there is not the resource to buy the child what it needs for what the child needs for school, but it's the stress of the parent and what's happening in the household, and that that has these health and behavioral outcomes for children. So I think that it really is not just the parent, but also the children in these families. So. Bruce, let me, and, and the answer to this can be no, but um, in your reporting and analysis of the, the, um, the work that Key has done, have you been able to get a handle at all on this question of whether saving reduces anxiety, makes people feel less stressful? Um, the answer is no. Okay, I will, But I will, I will uh, go beyond just the answer of, of no. The, 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 what you will see, and, and where does it show up, is when someone is desperate and now shows up at the branch mm -hmm. way too late to try to figure out what do I do about something. Um, and and when, they, when they leave us without an answer to the problem, you know they're walking out of that branch with, the, with um, a hopelessness that is concerning personally. So when you have people who care about their clients, um, it is in fact something that sometimes we have to, to, to help our own employees deal with that reality. Yeah, that was a real issue for some of the Financial Diaries field researchers <coughs> who um, were gathering these stories in person and often feeling, you know, to varying degrees, like really invested in the pain and struggle of the families they got to know. Um, it's, it's a, a genuine issue around um, the, how do we then give the advice in a useful way. Yeah. And, and the, the other point I wanted to make about this is that um, we haven't done as good of a job as we want to do on preventing these sort of economic harms, right, for households. And we have, but we have a lot of energy around it. There's a lot of innovation and excitement around how to help people save, how to, people, how to help people plan better, how to help people budget better. So on the prevention side, even though we haven't solved it, I see a lot of excitement. But on the, what do you do once it's already happened and this person is screwed? Like, I think we're, I mean, I don't want to say we're nowhere, because that sounds, we're, I, we're nowhere, right? Uh, we're, we're no, like on the, I'm already in trouble. Yeah. Now what? Um, is a totally different problem. And, and there's layers of that. There's the, I just had the first shock, 
but I didn't tell anybody it, so maybe, it'll, maybe I'll figure it out. Right? There, there's sort of layers of intervention that you can envision um, all the way through to when somebody saw, says that, you know, has to go bankrupt. I, I think we need to spend a lot more time on that end of the spectrum. See, that, that, that's where, excuse me, that, that's where having an opportunity to understand your financial health, mm -hmm. understand that you are in now in, are moving toward being in trouble. You may not have all the answers, but it, it, at some point there is an awareness that you have to have, because usually, um, you know, it's much too late for much to happen, um, and, you know, the, the experience is, uh, is pretty traumatic. So if we think about, you brought up prevention, but if you think about there's volatility, management, right. that's kind of, but I think of the savings piece as being in there. It's like once the volatility has happened, how do you manage it, and the prevention, better jobs. But I think our research with the having savings, people are less likely to be evicted, they're more likely to be able to pay their bills, that's got to flow through to, to stress. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so we had a question here. Go ahead. Um, uh, yeah, there's a mic coming in back of you. Maybe you can... So uh, regarding the job market, there's an awful lot of labor economists who believe that the volatility in the current labor market is just going to get worse, that, that we're moving more and more into contract labor. Um, the impact of technology uh, just uh, will, will cause uh, a lot of jobs, or part-time jobs. So in that context, uh, there's a lot of people talking about things like um, universal basic income. Um, and there are some experiments around the world happening. I'd just love to hear your panelists thinking about if that ever came about, do you see that as a solution? So Rachel, I'm going to start with you because I know you have thought about it and I know CFSI is working on it, but I yeah. hope everybody else will chime in. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm super interested in this idea with a lot of skepticism. So the idea of universal basic income is um, we could just guarantee um, all citizens a minimum amount of money. and. And to go even further than the way you frame the question, there are serious people, particularly in the technology community, who believe we will have massive structural unemployment. Not just underemployment, but 20% you know, of current jobs will go away. And they don't think it'll happen over the course of many decades. They think it'll be like this, right? Like one day we will figure out driverless cars, and the millions of people whose jobs involve driving cars will no longer have jobs. I don't actually, like, I don't personally believe that scenario. Um, there's, you know, there's pros and cons, and, and I think society changes much more slowly than that. And even once we figure out driverless cars, first it'll be the warehouse jobs, those will go away, of, you know, driving trucks around, driving little pallets around in Walmart uh, warehouses. Then, like, but there's a long path between that and all the passenger vehicles in Manhattan going away. Right, so, so I think it'll be slower. Um, and I think what will happen is we'll replace it with a lot of home health care jobs, frankly, like and a lot of personal service jobs, because we're going to still need those. Um, but nonetheless, I think this is an important issue, because so far those jobs aren't paying as well as the jobs that we're losing. And so you do have to think about how are you going to redistribute income across the society. And what I find fascinating about the basic minimum income debate is, in a way, it's like bringing back all of our, like bringing to the forefront all of these ideas that the asset building community has been raising for a few decades now around, like, do we just want to redistribute chunks of money at once? And what impact could that have on somebody's life? And I think in the, um, it's worth thinking about, but it, it's worth thinking very hard about the framing because people value working. It's a deeply, embedded part of all of our identities and receiving a handout doesn't feel the same. So in Alaska where people do get essentially a, a annual distribution, it's perceived as ownership. Like I own part of the re natural resources and therefore I get this check. You could envision that with a basic minimum income that it's I own the wealth our society has created and so I get p my share. Um, and, and to me that starts to get really compelling because it starts to go to the issues I was talking about around a trust and an interconnectedness in our society. So if you could give the money in a way that actually built democracy and actually built cohesion, I think it's really powerful. If you give it in a way that the way we frankly give welfare today, which is diminishing of people's humanity, I'm less intrigued. So Lisa, I can see you want to talk about that, but let's also see if we can talk a little bit about the sort of intermediate 
um, kinds of strategies, the portable pensions, the, the, um, the Myra account, those kinds of things. Lisa, go ahead. Well, I, I do think we need more of these strategies that help people build wealth along the way. You know, things like asset uh, savings accounts at birth, those sorts of things, the Myra, you know, letting people contribute differently to their um, retirement accounts. But I was, I was also going to say, you know, the, I just finished reading Andy Stern's Raising the Floor, which is all about right. universal basic income. And what's, what's really interesting to me is that I would say for the past six months, that question is coming up almost everywhere I go. And that never happened before. Right. And so I'm really encouraged about whether we go down that path or not. I think having a serious conversation about it is really important. Whereas I would say a year ago, five years ago, that it would have just been laughed off or thought to be impossible. Um, but I think people are seeing a different reality now. Um, you know, even with our welfare system, as Rachel mentioned, we have kind of two tracks, right? We have the sort of uh, people who get welfare and food stamps who are thought of as clients, and we have people who get Social Security and unemployment who are thought of as having a right to that income. And so I think right. we do know how to give people money in a way that makes them feel like it's their right. Um, but we tend to, uh, you know, have these different tracks. It just so happens that women are more in that clientization track and men are more in the kind of rights-bearing track. Um, but I, I do think that it's, um, you know, I don't know if it's practical, but I think, I think that people are willing to engage on that in a way that, that they haven't before, and I think it's very important. Can I just pick up on a different part of that question, and that is that the income uh, volatility that about 40% of people report that that monthly volatility comes from irregular work schedules. And there are efforts at the local level, some of this just-in-time scheduling, that there are better, uh, so better rules around how employers can treat employees that can have uh, better implications for preventing the volatility. Yeah. Questions? More? Yes, in the back. Haley? Oh. So we, so we talked a little bit about strategies, but I mean, if you were a Congress right now or like a state house, I mean, is there any, in terms of um, especially coping with these, you know, um, specifically with income volatility, I mean, you know, solving the problem, you know, where somebody's car breaks down and they can't get to work and they, you know, wind up in a whole spiral of poverty, uh, you know, are there any, you know, policy proposals out there or, you know, anything that you all are working on that might, you know, fill that gap? Okay, so we started the conversation. Caroline, you want to okay. keep going? Yeah, so I would say first there are proposals out there. So I think savings is a critical piece here. Um, so one is, as Rachel mentioned, we spend billions of dollars in this country to support <coughs> asset building, and it goes to high-income people, mortgage interest tax deduction, preferential treatment for retirement savings. I think one proposal is like a EITC savers bonus. So, uh, so you save for an emergency at tax time, and if you keep that money in an account for a certain amount of time, like a MIRA, there is a match. So it's a providing a financial incentive for low-income people to save, which right now they're not getting, um, and those, that money is going to higher-income people. And I just want to throw into this conversation asset limits. Ellen mentioned it. But right now, not only are we not encouraging low-income families to save, but we are discouraging them to save through these asset limits for means-tested programs. And some of our research shows that people are less likely to have a bank account. They're less likely to have a minimal amount of savings, at least $500, in these states that have asset limits. So we should be encouraging and providing a mechanism for low-income families to save. Um, and not discouraging savings. So before anybody else gets in on this one, I just want to remind you of the of the conversation we had earlier in the in the panel relating to medical debt and the ACA. Mm -hmm. um, how the healthcare system is revised um, will, I think, have a huge impact on less on income volatility than on expense volatility, although. Once you get into medical trouble, income volatility tends to follow because people can't go to work. And there are a whole bunch of diaries families where, where that's happened. I think we have some of these workforce bills that, that try to protect against, against excessive um, changes in scheduling. Um, I know, Rachel, the, the, the concept of George W. Bush got in trouble for talking about splitting up Social Security 
into something that is long term and something that is short term. And I'm not going to defend his proposal, but the notion that we can put a sidecar of shorter term savings for now next to the longer term savings that we're trying to get people to, um, to, to have is also a possibility. Others? I would yeah. also just say that you know one of the things that we've heard a lot about is the threat to um, Dodd-Frank and particularly the CFPB. I just came from two full days <laughs> of meetings at the CFPB and I always come away from there really impressed with all that they've done. So are they doing anything specifically about income volatility? No, but they're doing a lot of things that relate to the triggers that get people into volatile situations, right? So um, the CFPB is the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau. Um, it's, there's a lot of talk about figuring out ways to really um, defang it um, or de, uh, to, to really eviscerate it. And it's uh, returned a ton of money to people who've been bilked out of their savings or um, be, been sold financial products that don't work for them. Um, given credit scores that don't work so that they're paying too much for credit. So that's kind of a, it's a key point at which um, people are either being uh, made whole by um, uh, these kind of rulings that are coming down and or that the, all kinds of financial institutions, banks, alternatives, credit bureaus are being regulated in a way that they do right by consumers. And I think you know, it took 70 years between Graham Leach Bliley and Glass Steagall. It's only been seven years now since uh, Dodd Frank, and we're getting to a place now of kind of stripping away some of that protection. And I think it's, um, you know, I know everybody here has probably got all their um, elected officials on speed dial, but this is another, uh, this is another phone call to make because it's it's really under threat, and many people don't even know what it is. Okay, yeah. so we got. Time for two more questions, this one in the front, and then woman in the back, you had one too? Okay, go ahead. Um, I have a comment and a question. I'm gonna keep them very quick. The comment is, I recently spent about two years helping a family member who was in bad times, so I saw exactly what everyone was saying here. I saw this very intimately, and I've, it's, so it, it was kind of an insight. Um, so it's just reaffirming everything you're saying. My question, being prompted about medical, uh, is it seems to me there's a natural experiment, and I'm wondering if anybody has done any research on this, to look at and compare the US, both before and after ACA, uh, or during, uh, with the Europeans, the Canadians, the rest of the world where you're covered. You are a human being, you have medical coverage, and therefore a lot of that instability is gone, even compared to the ACA. And it, uh, so it's a question about any research you've seen yeah. about okay, that Okay, so we'll, we'll do an urban commercial here. Um, one of our <laughs> colleagues, Laudy Aaron, has done a lot of work on this issue. Um, however, we also have colleagues who are working on the other natural experiment, which is ACA uh, Medicare, Medicaid yeah. expansion states versus non-Medicare expansion yeah. states. Mm -hmm. So um, our colleague Kyle Caswell is coming out with something reasonably soon, and there are others who are also working on it. So look at the urban website. Okay, there we go. Last question. Uh, can you hear me? Okay. Um, I'm very interested in financial education, and, and Bruce, you mentioned it earlier uh, with KeyBank. I'm, I'm actually with KeyBank as well here in DC. Um, but I guess what strikes me as interesting when you, when you talk about teaching people to, um, helping people learn to save, um, have you looked into whether that is sort of a cycle, a, a generational cycle? And you know, when you say that the, the millennial generation is just you know, in a lot of trouble, uh, how, can, how can parents uh, learn to teach their children to save if they don't know themselves? And what are we doing to help the children learn the basics of financial, save, um, you know, financial education, financial health? Because it just seems like it would be potentially a cycle that just perpetuates okay. itself. Um, we could have a whole yeah. thing on this. <laughs> Bruce, why don't you start and then Rachel. So, so my grandmother used to tell me, you can't do better till you know better. And so part of that is about our educational system today. When I went to school, we had something that talked about, um, some people used to call it economics, some people used to call it whatever, civics. We learned about how, you know, the, the importance of savings, the importance of, of, of how to manage money. That was part of the curriculum. 
I don't think our financial education system today, in a universal way, speaks about that. It's a life skill. And we don't teach kids, we don't teach um, uh, within our society today that basic life skill. Yeah. Rachel? Um, so I'm glad you asked that because it allows me to talk about something Ellen had said to make sure to talk about. And I only have two minutes to make sure to talk about what Ellen said to make sure to talk about. Um, <laughs> which is that the way, the, the kinds of things we teach people need to change, right? So to Lisa's point, like the, the, um, there's not an obvious system. So like what is it you would tell people, right? We had one diaries um, participant who really listened hard during her financial education class in high school and loved it. And it really made an impression on her. But she also then said, well, they taught me how to balance a checkbook. They taught me how to track um, stocks in the paper, the paper, with the stock prices and how they've changed. Um, and then she graduated from high school and promptly got a debit card in the mail and was like, what, what's this? Right? And so the pace of change in financial services is enormous. The pace of change in what people need to know in their financial lives is enormous. So it's, to Bruce's point, a life skill. And I think that one of the things we need to do is, is gear less towards sort of deep, detailed curriculum and more towards rules of thumb that people um, can, mem can remember and activate really easily. And so Urban's done some really interesting work recently to explore specific rules of thumb that I think is really powerful. And it connects um, Elaine, the woman I spoke with, spoke about at the, at the top of our session. She actually uses one of the um, urban rules of thumb. She doesn't know that. But she says, <laughs> don't swipe the small stuff, basically. Um, her view is you should use cash, because then you feel it. You feel what you're spending. Um, and that's a much more powerful and useful rule for her than understanding the ins and outs of uh, mortgages and the different choices of mortgages and all the things she might learn if she went to a long class. So the, the information people get needs to be clear, needs to be actionable, needs to be memorable, needs to be ongoing throughout one's life, um, and it needs to be uh, doable in the moment. So Caroline and Lisa, you've got 15 seconds apiece. <laughs> <laughs> Go. <laughs> um, no, I just, I think that that's a really, uh, a, uh, the financial education is really important. We have another, the swipe the small stuff, the rule of thumbs, but also other work um, on financial education that it really does financial coaching. It helps, it helps families, it helps people uh, improve their financial well-being. So I think there, there's a number of strategies to come at this um, and that, that I think it's a little bit, it's not a one size fits all, but um, sort of looking at the different, all the different pieces that make up the whole. Lisa? So Mary and Hanukkah, who do the financial education work at the yes. CFPB, are yes. right there. <laughs> you guys should talk to them. They've done incredible research on this, too. And a couple of things sure. that they've found is that, the, um, unfortunately, that kind of traditional classroom financial education um, doesn't work as well as individual coaching. Mm -hmm. um, it's also that there's been a finding that it dissipates really quickly. And so am I getting this right, you guys? Right, so you know, you learn it, and then, like, sort of like what you were saying, then you yeah. get the other product, or you're in the situation. So that kind of point of decision, information is really important. One of the things people need to learn is where to go, um, and so I think the CFPB is a great resource because um, you can go on the internet and say, where do I get a free checking account, and you'll get all this stuff, and then you're paralyzed because you don't know which source of information is trusted. Um, we heard a report today even about. Um, uh, a mortgage provider in California that was associating itself with the government, um, which was untrue. So, you know, people are reading this stuff and getting these advertisements and they think that it's for real. So you really have to know where you're going. Um, the last thing I'd say for parents is, I love this book that's called The Opposite of Spoil that was written by Ron Lieber, who's the personal finance uh, writer for yeah. the New York Times, which um, I kind of bought the Kool-Aid and used his system with my kids. So. <laughs> And what, last thing, um, in our Millennials chapter, we found that Millennials are actually much smarter about money than they're given credit for. They're saving more, they're more savvy. Um, they're always called kind of deadbeats and leeching off their parents, but it's, it's not true. <laughs> so thank you all. Um, I want to remind you people, that everyone, that you can continue the conversation um, on Twitter at hashtag live at urban. Um, it's been terrific having all of you here in the audience and the panel. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I believe a little food and drink. 
Yes, Ivy says yes. Please eat and drink. 